So growing up, the first show that I ever saw was the musical adaptation of James M. Barrie's Peter Pan. And when I saw it, I'll never forget how I felt like Peter actually whisked me away to Neverland with the Darling family. I believed in Neverland so much. I became obsessed with that world, infatuated with the characters. Captain Hook, to me, terrified me. He was the scariest guy I had ever met. And so growing up, I was also really, really shy. And what I saw in Captain Hook is that if I pretended to be him when faced with a situation that I was uncomfortable with, then I could scare away the things that scared me. So for instance, if my mom and dad were trying to put me in timeout, I would kind of scowl like this and put my hand up like a hook. And um, sometimes I would even dress up as him. OK, uh, maybe I dressed up as him for seven years, mostly for Halloween. <laughs> um, so I just became very infatuated with this idea of stories and the characters within those stories. Uh, when I was a toddler, I had a huge collection of Disney figurines of all of my favorite characters, and I would play with them. And uh, one day, I was sitting by uh, the hot tub in my pool, by my pool. We were having a party for Fourth of July or Father's Day. And um, I was playing with my toys, and I had that Captain Hook figurine, of course. And I dropped it into the hot tub. And my instinct was I needed to save him. And so I jumped into the hot tub, and nobody saw me. And I didn't know how to swim, and I almost drowned. But my dad heard the splash. And um, so while I tried to save Captain Hook, my dad had to save me. And um, so I just always remained this like very shy young boy who cared so much about different stories and movies and characters. And in second grade, I had a teacher named Mrs. Simmons. Mrs. Simmons uh, had my class create storybooks for a classroom library. And we uh, would put them in the library, and then we could check out each other's books. So when I had the chance to write my own story, I was extremely excited about it, making up my own characters. And when I wrote it, she asked me if I would read it in front of the class, because she really liked it. She wanted me to share it with my classmates. This was a red flag for me. There was <laughs> no way I was about to get up in front of the class. But she put me on the spot. So I thought, it's fine. I'm just going to hide. So I went like this on my desk and uh, just thought they'd all stop looking at me. But when I peeked my head up, really red and shaking, kind of like I am right now, um, I just saw a bunch of eyes staring back at me like you all are doing <laughs> right now. But um, I wasn't ready to stand up and give a talk yet. So um, I decided, OK, I guess I have to do this. So I grabbed my story, and I walked to the front of the class. But then I turned my back and faced the whiteboard. And I decided, this is the only way you're going to hear my story. And I read my story. And I sat back down. But that night, uh, my teacher, Mrs. Simmons, had called my parents. And she told them, the way that Tyler communicates is through storytelling. That's his gift. And so my parents and my family guided me growing up to open up that gift. And I went to a middle and high school for the arts. And I took filmmaking classes and really got to explore storytelling a little bit more. And now, obviously, I'm a filmmaker, uh, undergraduate film and television major at NYU. But I guess the best way to explain what I was like growing up is to compare myself to Elliot from Steven Spielberg's E.T., The Extraterrestrial. And the thing is, Elliot is very afraid and alone as he grew up. He was very comfortable with his family, but scared of the world around him. But when E.T. shows up in his backyard one night, Elliot is forever changed. Elliot discovers friendship. E.T. is his friend. And you know, I think that everybody has their own E.T. He might not have shown up in your backyard yet. And he might not necessarily be a friend or a tangible person. For me, my E.T. was my discovery of creativity. And when Mrs. Simmons called my family, that was E.T. showing up in my yard. And um, I really do feel like I grew up with E.T. When I was in middle school, my grandpa Al suffered from Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. And my memories of him are of him being unable to uh, speak or even smile, even though he was very happy up here. And 
He could communicate to us, though, through a, um, a speaking machine where he could punch in words and it would say it back to you. And you know, it's oddly enough, it sounded a lot like the speak and spell toy that Elliot has in the film. E.T. learns how to speak through this speak and spell. He punches in these letters and a voice says it back. One uh, day, it was actually our, our Thanksgiving dinner. It would be my grandpa's last Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, we go around saying what we're thankful for. And he played his message on his machine. And he told us how grateful he was for us and how much he loved us. And I'm convinced that in that moment, that's when my creativity found its voice. That's when it learned to speak like E.T. did. Unfortunately, uh, for that next year, uh, my family went through a very difficult time where we experienced the loss of six different loved ones, um, the last of which was my close friend, Laura, who passed away at 14 years old. I had grown up with her and known her since elementary school. And she passed away in a car accident the day after I had seen her and we were playing in the playground. And for me, that was such a crushing blow because suddenly over this year I had to understand death, had to understand what this circle of life was. And now I saw that firsthand it wasn't just a story on the news anymore. It was somebody that I had known forever was now taken away. And you don't know when it's going to happen, but it can happen and you, it could be tomorrow. And so I had started to have all of these feelings. And you know, in E.T., Elliot and E.T. at one point towards the end feel like they're dying together. And at this point in my life, I had to um, uh, see somebody because I developed hypochondria, because I thought that I was going to die at any point. I had to um, leave my arts classes early so I could attend a bereavement session uh, in school. And I would grieve uh, by making these slideshows of family photos for um, the funerals instead of making films with my friends. That was how I started to, I guess, tell more stories. But the, my creativity, it felt like it was dying. I felt just numb. And um, when Elliot's told in the film that E.T. died, Elliot says he doesn't know how to feel anymore. And that's about where I was at. But you know what? I realized, as did Elliot, that growing up with E.T., you see that it's your heart that is going to lift you up and lift up those around you. When everyone says that, E.T.'s died, Elliot stays there and sees that, no, E.T.'s heart is still beating. E.T.'s heart is glowing, and nobody can stop it. And so that's what allows him and E.T. to escape all the things that scare them, fly past the moon, and send E.T. home to go help other people in another universe. And so in high school, I volunteered for an organization called the Heart Gallery. And what the Heart Gallery does is they take photographers to come in and photograph orphaned children who need homes. And those photos are put on exhibitions. And at those exhibitions, potential parents are hopefully going to come and see those photos, want to meet those children. And it expedites the process of matching a child with their forever family. I came to them, and we uh, were making videos of the children uh, in our area. We made videos of six orphan children. And within six months, all six of those children found their forever families. So it's funny because I used to, <laughs> I used to help people. I used to well, help myself by dealing with my problems, by pretending that I was Captain Hook. But now you know, I felt a lot more like, like Peter Pan. Because for every time that I had to sit through a funeral of somebody that I loved, for the six loved ones that I lost, and I just felt completely lost on my own. I had now helped a, um, I helped a child find their way home. And so I realized that creativity could heal things. It could heal me. It could heal those around me. It had a healing touch. And I saw that trauma could actually become our greatest triumph. In Stephen Joseph's What Doesn't Kill Us study, published in 2011, he talks about the shattered vase, the metaphor of the shattered vase. He says that when a vase shatters, that's when the trauma hits. We experience trauma, and those pieces of that vase go all over the floor. And one might think that it's like putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. You know you want to make that vase just how it was. But what you might end up with, 
or will end up with is something very fragile, something that could break at any given moment when you least expect it. And so what he suggests is that when we're able to look at that vase and make something new, look at that, all those pieces on the ground and look at the colors that stick out to us, the different shapes, create something that yes, it's changed, yes, it's not the vase we had before, but that's okay because just because things aren't the same doesn't mean that they're not good. And so I was trying to figure out, okay, how did, had I man how did I manage to know what to do with my shattered vase? How could we help children today know what to do when they have a shattered vase? And so I, I started looking at, um, well, who are my role models growing up? And I was like, okay, I had mom, dad, Peter Pan, E.T. And so I found that characters shape our lives just as people do. And I started looking at the world today, and uh, there were three tragedies that really struck me. It was the Aurora, Colorado shooting, the Sandy Hook shooting, the Boston Marathon bombing. When I looked at those tragedies, I looked at who those people were that committed those heinous crimes, and they didn't have those human relationships. They didn't have that support system. So when they were up on that cliff about to fall off the deep end, there was nobody there to scoop them up and say, hey, it's a lot more fun to fly than to fall. And so I was trying to think, well, who might children not have met yet today that they could really use an introduction to? And I, um, was thinking a lot about the Fred Rogers quote that was being passed around a lot, especially on the internet during the time of these tragedies. And Fred Rogers said, when I was younger, my mom told me that when I see scary things on the news, to always look for the helpers. There's always somebody helping. But to me, I thought, okay, let's try and push that forward a little bit. When we see helpers on the news, when we see things that scare us, let's go help the situation, let's be the helpers. Let's not just look at them. And so I want to share something with you all today. Um, I thought that the, maybe this could be my way of helping the, uh, uh, the situation. And it's an idea for an animated series uh, called Give Me Space, an animated series for ch children. And um, basically, nothing's necessarily happening with it, but the ideas behind it are what are really important to me. So <laughs> the concept is about this young, imaginative, seven and a half year old boy named Ty. And Ty has these twin older siblings, Nick and Rachel. Nick and Rachel want nothing to do with them. And when their parents go out one day, uh, they're babysitting and Ty wants to play and they say, <laughs> give us space, leave us alone. And so Ty does. Ty thinks they literally want space. So they're downstairs and they hear this rumbling going on and to their surprise and Ty's, he actually built a spaceship out of his bed that works and they see smoke billowing out the back of the bed like the rocket engines are firing up and when they look out the window that's not the neighbor's car passing by that's an asteroid and before they know it they are actually in a space station about to launch out of it and they quickly throw on their spacesuits and get in the cockpit and they blast off and when they blast off there's a toy chest in the back of the cockpit and um, Ty's labeled it rocket fuel and when they trying to figure out what's going on, they hear laughter in the cockpit, and they op open up the toy chest, and out comes this little guy named Cody. And Cody is Ty's the figment of his imagination, and he's just laughing. You think it's, it's hilarious that they don't know what's going on. And he tells them that they've entered Ty's universe, his Y-O-U universe. And Cody tells them that, that only the three of them can access this universe together, and it's up to them to keep it safe and happy, because otherwise it's possible nobody else will. And so uh, he explains to them each episode that they have a mission, a different mission to different planets within the universe, and when they go there, they resolve issues that really aren't so far from home for Ty and viewers his age. And so our mission through the show would be that children would begin to understand this idea that when faced with some of the world's most daunting problems, the key to solving them is through collaboration, compassion, and creativity. And so here's a look at a little map. Uh, and by the way, the drawings, uh, 
of, that you see up here are actually done by my younger brother. So this idea of siblings is obviously very important to me. But anyways, um, there's a planet called Planet Shumpy. And Planet Shumpy is a word that my brother uh, and I had in our made-up language uh, when we were growing up. And the thing is that when they travel to Planet Shumpy, they resolve issues that you might encounter at home. Everybody who lives here are literally these warm fuzzballs, and they live in family trees. And everyone knows at least three fun facts about each other. And um, they s talk in rhyme and song. And so when they go to this other planet, Planet Kirkleon, I had, <laughs> I had this friend in middle school who told me he had two middle names, Kirk and Leon. And I was always like, that's a planet. And so. Um, <laughs> And so here, every character is a different, literally a different shape or size, and they have a series of responsibilities and consequences if they don't uphold those, and they're overseen by a ruler, literally a ruler. And um, <laughs> the things that they ex encounter here are issues you might find at school, in social, social situations, things like bullying. But while they're here, they keep hearing about this place called the unforeseen, this distant world where people keep disappearing to and nobody knows what it is. But when eventually Ty and his siblings have to go there, they come to find that this isn't a scary place at all. This is where you go when you grow up. And it's whatever you want to make of it. And behind this world, it's important to me that we look at child development and what we know about it, but then we look at the world right this second and the things that speak to us that we would like to address, and we bridge those together. And so, for instance, we have behind this show, there would be Eric Erickson's psychosocial theory. And in that theory, he talks about the play age, where children are encountering the conflict of initiative versus guilt. Jean Piaget says in the, his cognitive development theory that there's the pre-operational stage around this time, where children are first starting to experience imagination and playing house. And um, who better to have a role model than a shy young boy about their age who has a wild imagination, who whisks his siblings away, takes that initiative on these missions in his own universe. He's not just playing house. And so beyond that, though, these are supposed to be characters that children grow up with. And so I thought we could incorporate what they're going to be transitioning into as they're watching the show. So for instance, Piaget's concrete operational stage says that children begin to understand that people are different that they have different thoughts and feelings, they understand uniqueness, and they start to grasp induc inductive reasoning. And um, then they start encountering hypothesizing later on. And so who better to have a role model than Ty, who has to understand his siblings, and his siblings have to understand him, so that they can understand the people who they're helping and be successful. Um, the show is dedicated to uh, uh, two siblings that I met at the Hart Gallery. And the older sister told me when we interviewed her that there's nothing she loved more than when her brother would run up to her, tackle her to the ground, and say how much he loved her. And I just wish that that was something that children and everybody could experience every day. So as an introduction to this world, I thought that that could be the central message of the theme song. So when I collaborated with Ram Silverglade, another NYU student, an NYU student named Angela Scafani, when creating this theme song, this was what we thought of, and I'd like to share it with you all to introduce you to how Ty's world might sound. When Ty wanted to play, give me space. When Ty wanted to build, give me space. So Ty rolled up his trousers without knowing what to do. If you just believe in you, you can make any wish come true. So give me space, where the adventures never end. Give me space, where every person needs a friend. We'll never stop as long as we can lend a helping hand. Give me space. Where the universe is ours, give me space. When there's trouble in the stars, we'll save the planet, help our friends, and make a brighter place. So give me space. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks.
So growing up, I realized that if I believed like Peter Pan, then I too might begin to understand what it feels like to fly. I too realized that I had the potential to heal others like E.T. And my hope is that as children go on these missions with Ty and his siblings to spread happiness and love in Ty's universe, then perhaps they too might someday go on a mission of their own to spread that happiness and love in our own universe. And my hope for us as people is that we too can be characters that children can grow up with. Because we too could be as adventurous and as free as Peter Pan. We too could be as healing as E.T. But also, most importantly, we too can be as caring as Mrs. Simmons, who once looked into the eyes of a shy young boy and saw within him that he had a neverland of his own to discover and sent him on a journey to find it. Thank you.